In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen. Please be seated. This morning in Episcopal churches from California to Maine, preachers are standing in pulpits and telling fish stories. Or more accurately, they are sharing their own personal anecdotes about fishing. Fishing as children, fishing with a granddad, fishing with nets or hooks and lines, fly fishing, ice fishing, deep sea fishing. Fishing stories that relate somehow to Jesus' call to his very first disciples. Simon Peter, James, and John are fishermen. And they leave their nets and their boats and their livelihood behind, seemingly without a second thought, in order to follow Jesus and become catchers, not of fish, but of people. I only have two fishing stories of my own. Both date from my elementary school years and both have more to do with the kind of bait used than with the actual catching of fish. And since we hear this or some version of this disciple fish story every year during Epiphany, I am regularly reminded that I don't have a lot of personal material to work with. But that may not be a very bad thing because the more I read this story, the more I'm convinced that it isn't really about fishing at all. Or perhaps a better way to put it is that this story is not meant to be a universal metaphor for what it means to become Christian, to follow Jesus, or to grow the church. No matter how creatively we tell the story, in any given fishing scenario, there is simply no good news for the fish. <laughs> the fish is tricked by a colorful lure or a bit of bait and bites down only to be heartlessly hooked and yanked up out of its lovely watery home or the fish is unceremoniously scooped up in a net with hundreds of other fish and thrown on ice. The fish have no choice in the matter and they are offered no opportunity for new life. On this Baptism Sunday, I want to make sure that Henry and Abby's parents know that the church doesn't view these two sweet children as little minnows to be captured against their will. <laughs> Baptism is an invitation, an initiation into a particular school of fish in a moving body of water that opens wide the possibility for them to grow up knowing and loving God and recognizing God's goodness in themselves and all creation. <clears throat> the promises that we make for them in baptism are action verbs because they and we are people on the move, following the living word, swimming, in the living sea. So I'd like to suggest that when Jesus calls his first disciples, he's not on the lookout for fishermen necessarily to fill this job description because discipleship is not about fishing but about following. Hear again what happens in our story from Luke's Gospel as Simon, Peter, James, and John are invited and initiated into the discipleship business. First of all, Jesus shows up at their place of work on the shores of Lake Gennesaret at the end of a long and unsuccessful day. As Simon Peter and his partners wash their nets, Jesus commandeers one of their boats for the purpose not of fishing, but of teaching the word of God to a crowd that is almost more than he can handle. Remember that at this point in Luke's Gospel, Jesus has already made Simon Peter's acquaintance, having visited Simon in his home and healed Simon's mother-in-law from a fever. Jesus has been traveling around the region for some time, teaching in the synagogues, casting out demons, stirring up trouble, and people are talking. On this day, Simon Peter and the other fishermen are accidental hearers of Jesus teaching to the crowd. And when Jesus finishes, he turns to Simon Peter and instructs him to take 
his drying nets, load them back into the boat, row back out into the center of the lake, and catch some fish. Now, these fishermen are tired. They've been hard at it all night, letting down their nets and pulling them back up with nothing to show for it over and over and over again. But instead of telling Jesus to buzz off, Peter respectfully says, all right, to this invitation he can't quite fathom. And when his nets hit the water, they are filled with fish to the breaking point and the boats begin to sink. Now comes the critical moment for Peter. Does he thank God for this miraculous haul of fish and set about getting them to market? Does he celebrate his success and make plans to expand the family business? Does he count this tale as the greatest in a lifetime of fish stories? No. Simon Peter forgets all about the fish. He falls to his knees. Like Isaiah in the temple, Peter recognizes that he, a nobody, is in the presence of the Lord, and he begs Jesus to go away from him because he is not worthy. It is precisely here that Jesus calls Simon Peter to be a disciple. In his humility and exhaustion, Peter demonstrates obedience, repentance, and faith. Do not be afraid, Jesus tells him, turning to include James and John. From now on, you will be catching people. Or more accurately, from now on, you will be catchers of people. Catchers of people. It's clumsy in the translation. The traditional fishers of men is more elegant. But the idea is the same. Jesus calls these three fishermen, ordinary people, doing ordinary useful work into a brand new vocation. Instead of nets and boats, the tools of this new trade are the word of God, open hands and trusting, fearless hearts. In other words, the catching these disciples will perform is less a fishing expedition and more of a high-wire act. They will be like trapeze artists, anchored by their knees on a swing, arms extended to catch the wrists of those in midair who have heard God's call to let go of their old life and reach out for the new. And the disciples are there to catch hold. The psalmist this morning sings to God, Though I walk in the midst of trouble, you keep me safe. You stretch forth your hand against the fury of my enemies. Your right hand shall save me. The sudden and miraculous catch of fish in chapter 5 of Luke's Gospel is yet another sign in this season of Epiphany that Jesus is the Son of God, the stretching forth of God's hand into human history to catch hold of us and save us. And this morning's fish story reminds us that it is in the presence of Jesus that the nets are filled up. It is in the presence of Jesus that our cup runneth over. Standing by the lakeside, Simon, Peter, James, and John they catch sight of what God has in mind for human beings and the entire material world. And that is fullness of life, abundance of purpose, undeserved and delightful gift of love, everything working together as it should. It's not about the fish. It's about Jesus, who reveals this essence of God, and they want to be with him. These first followers cannot conceive of what lies ahead for them or for this world. Nevertheless, they walk away from their boats and their livelihood and those nets full of fish, fat and thrashing without a word and without hesitation. Their transformation has begun. Like Abby and Henry, each one of us at our baptism, their actual initiation and into discipleship takes but just a minute 
And after saying yes to God's invitation, that's when comes the actual following of Jesus. And there is some fine print included with the exhilaration of being caught by God. Fine print spelling out what living that discipleship entails. Which, as Peter and James and John learned the hard way, is a lifelong process as they question and doubt and struggle and stray and at least once return to their nets when the going gets tough. As, of course, do we. The kingdoms and temptations of this world beckon. We are works in progress. And even for the most trusting among us, the answers don't always come easy. Will you continue in the apostles' teaching? Will you resist evil? Will you proclaim the good news? Will you love your neighbor? Will you strive for justice? Before we can say, I will, and then try to do it, we must face down the question that lies at the root of all the other questions, the hardest, perhaps, for us modern Christians. Can you, will you, keep letting go of whatever it is in this world that possesses you so that your hands are free? Can you, will you, continue to catch hold of the one who catches you?